This video has a look at how energy is communicated during chemical reactions. This is a bit of a throwback to chemistry 20, which has us look at energy in two different ways. The first is during the solutions unit, you would have a look at whether mixing something into water would cause the mixture to either increase or decrease in temperature. And if the temperature increased, we would call that exothermic, the reaction caused the surroundings to uh, heat up because energy was released during the reaction. But alternatively, the reaction could be endothermic, which would be uh, due to the temperature going down. And in this case, we would have energy absorbed from the surroundings. We then in the bonding unit had a look at that and said, this was due to the fact that during any chemical reaction, the processes of bond breaking and bond forming took place. And then you could study the magnitude of each of these processes. And if more energy were involved during bond breaking than bond forming, then we would say that the overall process was endothermic. And if more energy were released from bond forming than absorbed through bond breaking, then we would have an exothermic process. So. Really, at the end of the day, this course is interested in the difference or the net energy change, but uh, being aware of this background is important. So we're going to start from that position is what does uh, Chem 20 inform us about this situation? And really, the first thing that um, we're going to add that's new is this idea of collision theory, which is actually a late topic if you look at the curriculum but I think is relevant to the discussion. That really, the reason why reactions don't take place instantaneously is because there's actually a lot of uh, conditions that have to be met in order for a reaction to occur. This graphic was uh, lifted from compoundchem.com, which is a fantastic website. And in this case, it indicates that uh, a lot of things have to go right in order for a reaction to occur. So when the particles collide in the right orientation and with the correct speeds relative to each other, then what will happen is you will actually get to that bond breaking, which we refer to as activation. In fact, technically we refer to the intermediate state as an activated complex. And I'm going to simplify that in a future slide, but for the time being, we can call it an activated complex uh, just for correctness. Now, we're going to talk about catalysis later, but the fact is that reaching activation is very energetically demanding. Any type of bond breaking requires energy. So if we can do something to lower the activation, then that helps us to create more product. And a catalyst is going to do that. It creates an alternative bonding pathway that allows us to reach activation more efficiently. So let's have a look at how this might actually look on a graph. And you might have seen a graph like this. Um, sometimes these are called potential energy curves and sometimes they're called energy profiles. And something like this should have popped up uh, for you know, let's say dissolving something in Chem 20. But now we're going to be looking at actual chemical reactions and seeing how, how this looks. In this case, what we're looking at is the fact that during the combustion of methane, the reactants store more chemical potential energy than the products do. So during this reaction, it can be predicted correctly that as this reaction proceeds, what's going to happen is that there is going to be energy released into the surroundings, which is the difference in those two potentials. We refer to this as enthalpy. And so this enthalpy change is typically what we're going to be studying in this section of the course. Now, as mentioned before, we have this uh, competing process of bond breaking and bond forming, which we could show in this case as a curve as indicated here, where the rise in the curve is trying to show the bond breaking, and then the subsequent fall is showing bond forming. 
and hopefully you can see that the magnitude of the rise is smaller than the magnitude of the fall, meaning that we have released more energy during bond forming in order to create our products, so the net energy is released into the surroundings. That is shown down at the bottom by having the energy as a product in this reaction. So that's one of the ways that we're going to come around to communicating uh, energy is as a term in the equation. Now, in this case, we could look at this rise, this peak in the curve, as the activation energy. How much energy is needed in order to actually make that jump and progress to the products. And if we cannot overcome that energy barrier, then the reaction just doesn't go. This is why you can take a fuel, like gasoline, and leave it in the presence of lots of oxygen, and yet it won't spontaneously combust unless you reach activation, let's say through the addition of a spark of some sort. Okay, so now if we look at this through the lens of a molecular uh, system. So our methane and our oxygen are still combusting and we're still producing carbon dioxide and water vapor. But the question now is, what is actually happening on a particle level? It could be assumed that we still need to achieve activation and this is where my representation of an activated complex is really not accurate. But if we are still looking at this from bond breaking and bond forming, then you can imagine that what's happening to reach activation is that all of the covalent bonds in methane between carbon and hydrogen have to be broken. The double bonds between the oxygen atoms in O2 also have to be broken so that there can be a rearrangement of the atoms. And again, I'm admitting that this is an inelegant way of showing what actually happens. But now that we've separated all of these atoms out, we can now rearrange them so that hopefully what we're doing is creating carbon dioxide and water vapor on the other side. So that's one way of imagining what is happening during activation. Okay. Now, what happens when we add a catalyst is that we go through a separate pathway. In this case, we might grab the methane molecule and hook it up to a catalyst. In this case, it's suggesting it could be platinum. And what this does is it makes the bonds uh, more easily accessible to the oxygen. And this uh, extra pathway then lowers how much energy it requires to perhaps rearrange these bonds. In every case for something to be considered a catalyst, the activation energy has to be lower than the original uh, condition. So when we draw these out, you'll notice that the dashed line uh, has a lower uh, peak than the original line. Okay, so that's a little bit about how we might compare activation in an uncatalyzed condition versus a catalyzed condition. But hopefully that gives you an idea of what happens on a uh, molecular or even atomic level. So imagine if we find out the quantity of energy that's actually required in order for this reaction to occur. We reference that 802 kilojoules uh, or 802.5 kilojoules of energy gets released as one mole of methane undergoes complete combustion. Instead of having a generic notation like we see way up at the top, what we can do is actually insert this quantity of energy as a value right into the equation. So often when we're saying write the equation with the energy as a term, then this is what they're suggesting is for you to actually put in the, the known value right into that equation. One of the way of doing this though is to write it as an enthalpy change right at the end as a reference for that equation. Now, one thing here that's very important is to note that if we know that a reaction like this one is exothermic, we know that that energy is lost into the surroundings. And the way that we represent that is with the negative sign that we see with respect to the enthalpy change notation delta H. So that is also uh, something that we can apply in reverse. If you see an enthalpy change notation that has a negative sign in front of it, 
immediately you know that that is an exothermic reaction. Conversely, if you have a positive uh, in front of that enthalpy change, you know that that reaction is going to be endothermic, and we have one of those uh, later on to look at. So those are two fairly simplistic ways of representing the enthalpy changes. Now further down, what we can do also is to look at uh, molar enthalpy of a reaction with respect to different components of the reaction. Notice that in the balanced equation, there we have a 1 to 2 to 1 to 2 ratio of the different components. So depending on our focus, the molar enthalpy of reaction is going to change. Notice that molar enthalpy is shown with a slightly different symbol using delta RH instead of enthalpy change, which is just delta H. And depending on which substance that we're referencing, then we're going to have a different molar enthalpy of reaction uh, value. So in the first case, let's say that we wanted to study the amount of energy released per mole of uh, methane consumed. So we would actually calculate the 802.5 divided by 1, which is why we see the negative 802.5 kilojoules per mole of methane that is consumed. We know from the notation that since the energy is released, the negative sign is maintained. Uh, at the very bottom, we have 802.5 kilojoules released for every two moles of water produced. So in this case, the energy is still released. We have the negative sign in front of the 401.3. That, of course, is rounded to keep our sig digs correct. And then we just say it's this many kilojoules per mole of water. Okay, so that's a little bit about how we can take the information provided at the top and represent it in three different ways. The last way we're going to have to do this is as a potential energy diagram showing an actual value as far as the enthalpy change goes. So this is the same diagram that we had before, but where previously we just showed that this reaction was exothermic and uh, the arrow went downward. Now we can actually quantify this with the amount of energy uh, that is known. One thing to make a note of is that enthalpy change depends on the factor by which we multiply this, uh, this equation. So if you rewrote the equation to show two moles of methane undergoing complete combustion, the amount of energy released during that process would be twice as big. However, the ratio of energy per mole of methane involved stays at 802.5 kilojoules. Okay, so in short, the molar enthalpy uh, is a reference that will stay constant for the molecule that you're studying. So now we're going to repeat the process for an endothermic reaction. This one is important in particular because it is part of the curriculum for us to recall the processes of photosynthesis and cellular respiration from Science 10. So this is suggesting that during photosynthesis, as one mole of glucose is produced, 2,802.5 kilojoules of energy are absorbed through that process. So we can go through the different ways of considering the communication of this enthalpy change. The first is we can write the enthalpy change as a term in the equation. So we see that carbon dioxide and water will get together. They will receive or absorb 2,802.5 kilojoules of energy. This will produce a mole of glucose and six moles of oxygen. If we wanted to rewrite this then as the reaction, but then have the energy term separately, we would have the equation appearing the same way. We would write the delta H term at the end, indicating that that energy was absorbed, and therefore we have gained 2,802.5 kilojoules of energy through that process, as indicated by the plus sign. In this case, we can uh, choose to reference this amount of energy to a particular chemical. Doing that for glucose is a little bit boring because of the coefficient of 1, so I've chosen to look at it uh, through the lens of carbon dioxide. So in this case, what if we ask how much energy gets absorbed 
for every mole of carbon dioxide that is consumed. If you have a look at the overall process, we see 2,802.5 kilojoules absorbed for every six moles of carbon dioxide. So we put that together into a ratio. Numerically, we just solve for what that ratio produces, and we interpret that as being uh, that positive 467.1 kilojoules are absorbed for every mole of carbon dioxide that is consumed. The last thing that we can do with this is to show the overall process like this. And in this case, we would see uh, that we have less potential energy stored in our reactants as we have in our products. So in terms of just the straight ratio, we see that the reactants store less energy than the products do. Now, we still have to overcome activation, and that's actually important to make a note of. So we still do have an activation energy that we have to overcome. Uh, in the case of a living system, though, this is helped out through the use of enzymes and uh, great stuff like that. One thing that I'll just make a note of is since this is an actual reversible reaction, read in this direction, look at this through the process of uh, photosynthesis. And if we reversed it, you could consider that the reverse process is uh, cellular respiration. You can then think of what's happening here as having two separate activation energies. If you go in the forward reaction, you have an activation energy that appears in this location here. However, if now you reverse the reaction, you have an activation energy that would appear here. And we can actually tell something about the overall energy of the reaction also by looking at these two values and considering uh, how they relate to the enthalpy change. In fact, if you took a difference between these two values, then you would get the net result being the enthalpy change. One thing to note is that because activation energy is thought of as a process of bond breaking, which is always endothermic, activation energy will always be represented as a positive value. So that hopefully makes sense. So that's the end of the video in terms of how to communicate enthalpy, and you should be able to interchange then between all four types of communication.